Thanks again for joining us at the Winds of Change event at Duke University, where we're diving deep into the practical realities of offshore wind energy development. This panel will focus on offshore deployment issues, supply chain, and transmission. A reminder again, this session is being live streamed and recorded. So now I'll hand it off to our moderator, Catherine Collins. Thank you, Brian. All right, gonna make sure my mic works here. Um, Good morning. I think it's still morning, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Collins, president of the Southeastern Wind Coalition. We are a nonprofit based here in the Southeast. I am based in North Carolina, but we've got folks from Virginia down to Florida and over to Louisiana. Um, I am really excited to be moderating this panel today um, and uh, am joined here by my friends. Uh, Mary Yang is a special advisor for FERC Commissioner Allison Clements and advises on a range of electric, natural gas, and oil matters. Her portfolio in the commissioner's office includes transmission policy, distributed energy resources, and cost of service rates. Next to Mary is Hakan Osman. Hakan has been Senior Vice President of Projects and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Prismian PowerLink since 2018. Prior to this, he served as Chairman and CEO of Prismian Group North America uh, from 2011 until 2018. And next to Hakan is Charlie Papavizas, who is a partner at Winston and Strawn LLP, where he chairs the firm's top-ranked maritime, maritime and admiralty practice. He's widely known for his experience with the Jones Act and the U.S. offshore wind industry. He's been actively engaged in the U.S. offshore wind sector since 2009 and counsels numerous clients in various aspects of the industry, including obtaining the first Jones Act offshore wind-related ruling in 2010. Um, so as you can see, we've got a, a great lineup of folks here. Um, on the previous panel, we heard about some of the complications or challenges within the offshore wind development space. And, uh, and this panel here aims to dive into some of the um, some of the, the deeper aspects of that. So um, we've got Mary who's going to cover transmission policy, Hakan looking at uh, some policy as well as supply chain implications of inflation on supply chain. Um, and then Charlie uh, with his expertise in the maritime law sector, um, looking at uh, things like vessels, terminals, ports, um, and uh, and we'll find a great way to to tie all of this together with a neat little bow at the end. But um, very excited to hear from our panelists. So again, much like the uh, previous panel, we will have presentations from each of uh, each of these folks here, and followed by a robust Q and A. I'm excited to to see what you all put in the Slido. I, I believe it is the same. Um, yes, I'm getting nods. It is the same. Uh, uh, text number that you can use. So um, you should be able to just follow through from what you were using in the previous panel to ask questions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Um, good morning. Um, so I will not be using slides up here. So the, hopefully that will simplify things just a little bit um, from my end. So um, I've got to start with the obligatory comment that I'm speaking for myself and not on behalf of any uh, for commissioners or the commission. Um, but I will note areas in which my boss, Commissioner Clements, has spoken about and has focused on in, in the past year. Um, just starting with a, a roadmap of what I want to discuss today. So transmission, definitely, we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, I'd like to start with sort of the overview of FERC's role in this space for those who don't steep themselves in FERC regulatory law each day. Um, FERC priorities, we have a couple of uh, pending reforms that I can discuss. Um, offshore wind opportunities and challenges from a regulatory perspective, and then what FERC can do and what can be done without FERC. I think those are really important distinctions to make in this space. So just starting off with a FERC 101 for students out there, first of all, you should come work for FERC. We are looking for um, good people to come and, and join us, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the space. So we have five commissioners at its full complement. We currently only have four, so there is one vacancy. Um, as a commission, we probably vote out 40 plus orders and opinions a month. So it's a very active agency. So we are medium size, we uh, pack a big punch and we do a lot of work. Um, our range of jurisdictional authority. So on the electric side, I'll say, 
uh, includes regulation of wholesale markets, wholesale sales, electricity, um, transmission planning, transmission rates, uh, corporate transactions for jurisdictional entities, et cetera. We also do have natural gas pipeline um, certificate and rates authority, and as well as oil rates, but I won't get into those today. Um, most relevant for our discussion today is FERC's jurisdiction and transmission planning and how FERC issues um, rules that impact transmission planning. So um, before I get in, before I get into sort of details of FERC's priorities and the recent reforms, just want to set the stage for FERC's role in all of this. I think that FERC is a technology neutral economic regulator. Um, the goal that FERC has, the mission of FERC really from the statutes that it, uh, that it carries forth is to make sure that these rules and these regulations um, leave customers with cost-effective and reliable energy. So it's cost-effectiveness, it's reliability. A lot of this in my boss's view and in our office's view and many others who follow FERC is the fact that many of these regulations are outdated and not catching up to the current market conditions, not catching up to the transition that we're seeing and not catching up to the extreme weather that is bearing down the grid. So a lot of these reforms are made in that context. So I'll start with um, FERC reforms. And for those of you who practiced before FERC, I know we are keeping you guys very busy <laughs> for this past year. There are a handful of large agenda items that have been pushed through in last year. So the first one is what's called the Transmission Planning Notice of Proposals Rulemaking. I'll just use NOPER from now on. So that is a large rule that is um, intended to overhaul what was formerly Order 1000 um, to help regions and encourage them to uh, conduct more comprehensive long-term planning. So in there, we have a proposal for long-term scenario planning with some regional flexibilities, there are some aspects of that that include you know, input from states, making sure that they have buy-in into the process, um, cost effectiveness in transmission planning as well. Um, the second large NOPER that we have out there is an interconnection NOPER. So many of you are aware of the long queue lines all around the country, um, especially to interconnect solar, wind, and, and battery storage. And I think that this NOPR seeks to address a complex set of interconnection issues in sort of a nuts and bolts way. We've talked a little bit about the cluster process, I think, in panel one. Um, those reforms are proposed in interconnection. Um, the third we have uh, last year in October was this conference on cost management. So if we are going to build out transmission in the magnitude that we need to to achieve these state goals, then we are talking about a lot of transmission and a lot of money. So how do we keep those costs managed? Um, that was the subject of the, the conference and, and FERC is reviewing some of that feedback. And finally, I'll just mention there is a fourth issue that the comments are um, still ongoing. So those of you who are following in a regional transmission planning, and by that I mean transmission planning between like PJM and MISO and SVP and, and interconnecting ISO New England with um, other regions. So that in a regional planning workshop occurred in December of last year with the commission. And we are um, now soliciting comments on what uh, the public thinks about um, the legal ability and how to design a minimum interregional transfer capability. It's a lot of words to say, um, is there a way and should, you know, legally, but also how do we design a way to require regions to have a minimum amount of ability to transfer power between regions, which is so important to, if you recall, um, Winter Storm Uri and um, other storms where we really needed to leverage uh, resources from other regions and bring them in um, to resolve price disparities and, and shortages in, in neighboring regions. So those are the priorities that um, FERC is focused on right now in the transmission safe space. Um, just to pause and focus on offshore wind a little bit. So people ask, you know, what is FERC's role in offshore wind? And I would say offshore wind is such a tricky puzzle because when it comes to the transmission piece of offshore wind, it involves all of the reforms I just discussed. It involves planning, it involves interconnection, cost management, in a regional planning um, on a broad scale. So we've discussed a little bit about 
the transmission needs of the southeast region. So um, the, the state of the transmission development for offshore wind in the Atlantic coast is quite different depending on the region that you're looking at. So we have the um, northern regions and northeast regions that have started to develop radial lines, states, so you know New Jersey, New York, to their offshore wind uh, facilities. And radial lines are not the most effective um, in the long term. I think most would agree that the best way to approach this is a proactive, and we discussed this in panel one a little bit, a proactive approach so that transmission planning can include um, lines that are mesh connected to other lines that might connect to other regions that might form a backbone of transmission along the Atlantic coast. So instead of overlapping lines, duplicative lines, wasted lines, <clears throat> or, or, you know, for instance, um, using up the limited corridor space that we have with lines that aren't efficient, is there a way for all the regions to come together and proactively plan so that we do this right the first time? So I think there is tremendous opportunity there. I think in an ideal world, we could harness that low cost um, wind energy, carbon free energy, bring it in onshore um, through multiple regions. And you can connect, for instance, PJM to North Carolina. Um, you could connect uh, you know, other regions together that have offshore wind and potentially form a way to increase reliability for those regions. For instance, when one region needs a little bit more from another region during times of stress, um, and to also reduce price disparities between those regions and make this a more cost-effective exercise. But there are challenges, right? Actually, many challenges. The window is closing um, because states are already starting to build radial lines. And so the window for effective coordination is um, very limited. We need to start planning now um, in the long-term proactive way. And what do I mean by coordination and planning now? Um, there are deficiencies currently in the regional and interregional transmission process. What we really need are states to come together. So states who have an interest in this and, and the resources for offshore wind to come together and together study the needs, the transmission needs they have to identify the right facilities that would be the most cost effective for their region. Um, they need to agree on a voluntary cost allocation methodology. I can describe that later, but cost allocation is really contentious. Um, they need to incorporate these into their regional plans so that we don't have duplicative lines planned for in the future. Um, all of this is hard and we all need to do this in a way that involves um, stakeholder input. And we need to do this in a way that um, makes it the most effective outcome the very first time. So um, just noting on the Southeast region, I do, you know, I think that a lot of the work about interregional planning and regional planning has been focused on the Northeast regions. Um, but I would say that the Southeast region has that opportunity to consider long-term planning as well. I think um, it's not off the table to have uh, sort of a, a transmission planning process that um, includes not just the Carolinas, but can be interconnected, like I said, to PJM um, or elsewhere. So I think interregional planning across the board in all regions is something that should still be on the table. So what can FERC do? Um, well, I think the obvious answer is, you know, the, the four uh, initiatives I discussed, two of them are a little further along as NOPERS. FERC could finalize those. And um, we are currently see, uh, sort of uh, going through the comments that were provided. Um, I think, though, um, the question is whether if those rules even passed in the form that they were proposed would actually make the difference that we need. Do they go far enough? Um, will they be implemented quickly enough to make the meaningful, and I think that question is still open. Um, I'm not sure that waiting for the perfect conditions or the perfect rule is going to get us there. And the proposed rules, in my view, aren't perfect. They were consensus rules, um, <clears throat> voted, um, of course, in a bipartisan way at FERC, but uh, they have left out, you know, critical components of the reform that many stakeholders feel are needed. I think one obvious one for those who are sort of 
seeped in this world is participant funding for interconnection upgrades. And I think things like that are not contained in the current proposals. And so what do we do about the fact that these rules aren't yet finalized and they will take years to implement? So I would encourage, and my boss has said this as she's gone in, in her various speeches um, around the country, that states and stakeholders don't necessarily wait for FERC to get some of this planning done. So stakeholders and you know states can get together and do their own planning study um, for both offshore and the onshore needs that they have. Um, they can, you know, create regional task force or regional committees. They can create a framework and then bring it into FERC for a what's called a Section 205 filing um, under the Federal Power Act, which basically allows FERC to approve things that are brought before it under its jurisdiction. And I think that that path might be quicker and more effective than waiting for this compliance process to play through for the rules that FERC currently has on the table. Um, we have seen some rumblings of coordination um, and we are encouraged by it. So we've heard about the, um, the Federal State Offshore Wind Implementation Partnership. So that's a White House-led um, collaborative with I believe 11 governors. Um, that they, you know, they've started talking about some supply chain issues, but at some point I, I hope that they do um, tackle the transmission planning challenge. Um, we've heard that New England states recently have announced a new regional energy transmission infrastructure initiative. I think all of this is progress, but we don't have anything that is comprehensive as the way that I've laid out sort of earlier in my remarks. So I think to get this to work, we would need to have a lot of state buy-in um, from the start to the concept of long-term planning. I think that's very difficult to get past. Um, you know, states across RTOs and non-RTO regions needs to get together and um, share visions and, and plan together. So I think I'm just gonna touch on the tricky issue of cost allocation before I sum it up. Um, cost allocation is one of the most difficult components of transmission planning, if not the most difficult component. And for those of you who don't know what I what I mean by cost allocation, it really is the question of who pays for a transmission line, especially as it crosses regions or may have um, beneficiaries in one state, but to cross a different state or the, the payers of the transmission line are a different um, state than the beneficiaries. There are questions about you know, which states get to um, get the benefits, which states have to pay. Um, this is sort of like, you know, splitting a bill at a restaurant, except it's much more complicated that, than that in the sense that it's, it's states have to voluntarily come together in many ways to have that cost allocation methodology that works for them. And we have some recent um, collaborations in the PJM region on states doing something more of a voluntary approach together, but we don't have real cost allocation solutions across the board for um, all states and all regions. So we continue to have the question of who's going to pay for these assets. And I would just say that the problem of cost allocation, in my view, should not slow down what is needed in the initial stages of planning. And I think that's because if you think about a regional collaborative that's going to bring together many states, to talk about long-term planning, there are so many questions to answer first. Like, how do we set this body up? How do we um, have a governance uh, approach for that? Um, what is the mechanism for ensuring that it appropriately affects, sorry, reflects state goals? Um, once we get through all those initial planning questions, we might have the foundation and the relationships in the space to really talk about um, fair cost allocation. So I'm just gonna sum this up. Um, there is what I think a timing mismatch between um, how quickly we need transmission planning to start and um, the regulatory processes that will take some time to resolve. So even if you know the FERC's various notices of proposed rulemaking were became final rules yesterday, which they did not, um, it will take years before compliance proposals um, wind their way through the system and we are actually seeing results from the rules. So while FERC is working on this, I would just encourage stakeholders and states to come together and do some of the planning on their own. Um, if they can find a way to come together and bring a 205 to FERC, I think that uh, would be the most expeditious way to get some of this started. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, 
Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, transmission has, has certainly become, uh, I, I feel like it's, it's, we're starting to hear more and more about transmission in the media. I've seen a number of, of um, articles this week in publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post about uh, bringing renewables on and that the biggest constraint right now to actually building new renewables is uh, interconnection. So certainly something that for those of you who are looking at, at career paths or um, transfers, uh, sounds like Mary's got a job for you, um, <clears throat> or at least a job interview. Uh, <laughs> and I also appreciate how um, uh, the discussion about states coming together to um, to bring some of these transmission solutions to FERC. And um, I feel like maybe she just gave the Smart Power MOU states a little bit of homework. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So next we're going to move to Hakan. Hakan, I'm going to give you, yeah, this. So it's just the left right there um, and dive into supply chain. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I usually talk to engineers or tech uh, people uh, or investors, but this time it's a very diverse, uh, let me say, um, group that I'm talking to. It will be challenging. On top, my daughter is listening to me, so she will listen 15 minutes straight to me without interruption. That's also a challenge for her. So um, I, I, I thank you for uh, inviting me to this um, exciting uh, adventure. Uh, that we are going through here in um, also in the US, uh, finally. Um, we are um, uh, a cable company, so we do all kinds of cables. We uh, last maybe 100 years, we are um, connecting countries, connecting, um, let me say, people uh, from the telecommunication to uh, energy. And uh, you see uh, Leonardo da Vinci, this is our vessel. Um, this is the state-of-the-art vessel. It took us 30 years to develop the experience to build into this vessel. Uh, the last one was um, Julia Verne, and um, she worked hard 30 years now. She is retiring. And we are investing in another one because the offshore wind is taking off, and we are investing. So we have uh, currently... Um, a fleet of five, six vessels that we do our own installation. Um, and um, just to give you a flavor of our company, apart Leonardo, uh, we are an Italian um, headquartered company, uh, stock uh, in the stock market, um, uh, Milan. Uh, and um, we went through the Goldman Sachs process, uh, as you know, the private equity. Uh, they taught us how to manage the cash. And finally, um, I think we became now the world's largest cable company. Uh, and whatever projects you are listening to, 50% of all these projects we have been involved in. So any uh, interconnect or any offshore wind um, that is happening around the world in the North Sea, in the US, in Australia, in uh, the Chinese Sea, uh, in Southeast Asia, we are present. So um, we see many challenges that the world is, um, let me say, facing, and we are actually in the heart of uh, some of these um, solutions uh, to these problems or these challenges. Uh, the energy transition, um, I'm happy to see this as happening. Uh, when I started as a young engineer 30 years ago in Siemens, um, when we were talking about um, retiring the, um, uh, the towers and closing that business unit, it wasn't so exciting. After 30 years, now we are seeing that this is happening onshore and offshore. So the digitalization is, as you know, a part of it um, and the smart grids. And we are contributing to also um, to connect um, these offshore winds and uh, to manage them also uh, correctly. Um, then um, the climate ambition is not only our Prismian's ambition, but we have also some uh, significant targets to reduce in our own facilities, um, our carbon, uh, let me say, footprint. Uh, on the other hand, we are contributing uh, also with uh, scope three, um, uh, definitely to, uh, to help uh, uh, to reach the targets that are, all the countries are setting. So we have uh, been, and we are still in about 50 countries um, 
108 factories we have all around the world. In US, we have 22 facilities, factories. Uh, 26 are in these centers uh, and about 30,000 employees. Um, we are about 12 billion, but when we talk about 5% um, of uh, majority of the cable, um, um, uh, let me say the content of the cable in big infrastructure projects is about 5% on the average. I'm not talking about the offshore wind, we are a little bit higher there, but you can uh, imagine that we are uh, significantly present in many, um, let me say, infrastructure projects. So in the US, uh, sorry, yes, you're right. I'm not, um, I'm getting acclimated. So uh, let me say uh, in the US, um, we have uh, been working, uh, especially last four years, we are working on Vineyard Wind, um, the first offshore wind project in the US that we are going to energize at the end of this year, third quarter, possibly, uh, if everything goes right. So um, then we have, of course, we have uh, listened to our um, customer here, Dominion, um, uh, where um, you know we will do the coastal Virginia offshore wind uh, with them together. And then in Massachusetts, we have two um, significant projects which are currently under discussion uh, because of the challenges that the um, um, developers are facing, the challenges of the developers are inflation that we are facing also as individuals, as you know. So, but um, the Park City Wind and Common Belt Wind, um, I'm sure it will go uh, ahead. Um, then we have some interconnects, interesting interconnects, which uh, are going to be part of these transmission challenges that we see. Uh, the So Green project is a very interesting project. It's the first 500 kV XIPE cable connection that will happen in the US. Uh, which uh, this is going to be um, helping uh, to transmit the energy that onshore or offshore um, that will go to the grid, uh, which we are talking about, that the grid is not where it should be in the US. Yes, uh, it is not there, but there are so many opportunities to bring it up to um, the work. So uh, again, um, with Equinor, Empire Wind 1-2, we are also part. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in order to facilitate all this, what do we need? We need to invest. So we are investing in the US. Uh, it will be a beautiful facility in Massachusetts. You see in the picture there, uh, and you see that there is a vertical tower, uh, which is about 200 meters, where actually the production of cable is going to be be so it is not a production that we do like horizontal production that we are used to machines one after the other we are extruding the cable from the tower down so uh and this is um a technology unfortunately uh which is new in the us so we are bringing new technology for 500 kv xip uh, which uh is a technology that has been developed with lots of experience after 30 years. So um, this is going to be um, hopefully uh, in two and a half years producing at least the prototype cables. Unfortunately, when we talk about challenges in order to build a facility, you need 18 months of permits in the US. So we are facing 18 months of permit requirement until we put a plan to start digging the foundation. So I think we have to do a lot to improve this. Um, that is not, um, you know, um, helping the industry uh, from the supply chain perspective. So what is our intention with this? Of course, the intention is to develop the 30 giga in 2030 that has been set as targets. And this facility, uh, of course, is going to be um, uh, creating in important jobs. So um, every year we are recruiting about 150 people uh, and half of them are engineers and half of them are, um, let me say, um, qualified engineers and we develop these. So just to tell also that these production units are not only uh, producing cables, but they are also uh, creating needs for universities, 
and also uh, technology, uh, let me say, enthusiasts to create lab. In the US, we don't have a lab, uh, just to be um, very uh, here blunt. We don't have a high voltage lab that is able to test these systems. Uh, there is only one facility that is in Canada. Uh, apart from that, in only in Italy, there are five labs that can be, do these tests. So we need more investments here. We need more technology investments. And we need also that the universities are pushing power, not only signaling and telecommunication, but also power, because we need people that are working in the energy sector. And energy sector is the area where the growth is going to become uh, in the long term. So uh, I see that also students are here. Uh, I, I strongly recommend um, not to always to look towards Google, but to look over also to our TikTok <laughs> or other companies like uh, you know the software companies. But you you guys have to work also in where the real uh, hardware is and to put the software on top and then to develop and to grow and be part of that growth. So when we talk about, oh, sorry, I'm, I still didn't learn this. So uh, when we, yeah, okay, I'll do it, sorry. So um, um, when we talk about these uh, offshore platforms and offshore wind, and we, we spoke about different technologies. We were talking about uh, technologies that are fixed, uh, or we call them bottom fixed, because they are anchored uh, to the bottom of the sea. So um, we do this not only 27 miles, as it was said by the other panelists, we go beyond 100 miles, 250 miles. We connect uh, countries. Uh, we are working on a project between uh, Singapore and Australia, which is 4,200 kilometers. So the art is the length, the distance, uh, and, and then also the environment. These vessels that we are using, utilizing are vessels with harsh environment. When there is high waves, they stay steady. They, they, we call them DP2, DP3, dynamic position vessels. So they don't move, even if there is a high wave or not, in order to keep uh, the cable steady. And we are, we are putting this cable, or we are laying this cable under the seedbed, 10 meters under the seedbed. 3,000 meter below the sea. So we, we have ROVs, remote operating vehicles, that we control from the vessel to install them under the seabed. So it's, it's very exciting, very challenging, very difficult, but very also lucrative. And, and also, um, let me say, uh, we are very proud of what we are doing. We are proud because we work in the environmental, improvements so we are contributing to improve the environment on the other hand we are also uh, helping um, to reduce the cost uh, so that these projects are going to go forward and and from that perspective mediterranean is a different challenge because it's very deep mediterranean is uh, touristic also very much so you cannot have uh, fixed um, uh, let me say bottom fixed uh, uh, wind farms, you need floating wind farms. California is the same, Australia is the same, Japan is the same. So you need further away from the cost. So you need to have higher technology uh, where everything is dynamic, everything is moving. So in moving environment, we need good engineers that do these calculations on dynamic cables and dynamic environments. And this is what we do. There is no commercial um, um, floating wind farm yet. We are now discussing one in Mediterranean that will be about two gigawatt. All the others are samples, like three towers here, two towers there, but there is nothing substantial. So we have to drop the cost and we have to go with 16 megawatt towers. And this is what we are trying to do. We go with bigger, bigger cables, bigger towers, and more difficult environment. So um, just a few, yes, oh, okay. Uh, just a few more uh, things to talk, thank you. Okay, the cost, I don't concentrate on the graph much, but you see that the cost is dropping. This was a cost graph before the war, Russian-Ukrainian war. 
you know, everything has changed after the Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, because every country wants to now be energy independent. No one wants to be responsible uh, of taking uh, policies, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, dependent on someone else's policy. Uh, they want to be independent. And that's, that's the, I think, after all the wars that we saw in oil and gas, I think this is something that we have to do. We have to um, be able to make our policies and uh, decisions independently, not depending on. And this is what drives the costs down, the technology. Uh, we are driving the cost down, uh, uh, increasing the size of the cable and the transmissions. And at the same time, this is helping, uh, you know, uh, uh, the countries uh, to concentrate on their resources on uh, other, uh, let me say, uh, investments other than um, uh, wars, uh, let me say this. So, uh, of course, these costs are a little bit higher now, but uh, I think uh, in the long term, uh, we will come uh, to below $50 of cost. This is the target. Uh, there are some projects in the US that are uh, that have been before, uh, you know, uh, the war, it was about $80, uh, some of the projects per megawatt energy generation. Um, but it cannot compete, of course, with the uh, solar. Uh, I have customers in Australia that are producing solar energy for $8. So $8 per megawatt. It's, it's, it's crazy. So Australia, North Africa, they are going to become the exporters of energy of solar energy. So, but offshore wind is, is getting there. Uh, today we announced the first four gigawatt, and I have trouble in, in pronouncing the, uh, the name of the project. It's IJ Muden in uh, Netherlands. Uh, it is going to be the first four gigawatt um, with 500 kV connection. Uh, this will reduce the cost significantly. Of course, we don't know exactly what the cost is, but I can tell you it's in the range of 50, 60 pre-war. Um, and now, as you know, after the war in, in Europe, the cost was about 600 euro per megawatt. So 10 times, 11 times, 12 times. Okay, the, we, we think 30 giga is going to be a good target for the US, but I think there is more potential um, if we are able to uh, attract technology and also the supply chain. If we can do this, I think uh, we can go uh, beyond 45, 50 giga. There is installed capacity about 100 giga in uh, nuclear. So uh, half of that we can maybe replace. So that, that could be a good target for the long term. Having said so, uh, now in my last slide, and uh, I will try to wrap it up. Um, what are the main, uh, let me say, uh, constraints? Uh, first, we said supply chain, uh, because now everyone wants to be energy independent. Uh, to be frank, I have never spoken in my life so much with ministers of energy that I have spoken in the last two or three months, because everyone wants to have the capacity. They want to give you advanced payments to build facilities in order to be able to capture that capacity. We are not able to do this if we don't secure the supply chain. So we have to supply, secure the supply chain and the initiatives like um, the Inflation Reduction Act, they will help. But the more is that we need policies that are long lasting and not changing. If the policies are uh, changing every four years, every eight years, every six years, then things are a little bit more difficult. We have to have long-term policies and the industries are going to come. We never invested in a factory because of invest incentives, never. Because if you build a facility because of in incentives, after the incentive is gone, you need stability and long-term business opportunities in order to continue. So incentives are important as a Kickstarter, but the more important thing is the after what is going to happen. So then permitting, we spoke about the permitting. Permitting is, is a, a little bit of a problem. Even building a facility takes like 18 months. So permitting, there is a lot to do. Uh, we, we would like to help 
in that. And I can say that things are moving faster and improving, but uh, it's not as fast um, as it should be. On the other hand, technological advancement, we are now, US is, is in a perfect position because the technology has been already tested last 30 years in Europe. We will get the cream in North America if we invest into the right technology in 500 kVs in the utmost voltage, biggest wind farms to reduce the cost. So this is going to be then, um, you know, a game changer uh, because uh, in Europe, there are going to be uh, lots of wind farms that are already built, but are not in the scale as in the US. If we go with 16 megawatt towers, there are many towers in, in Europe with four megawatts, two megawatt, three megawatts. So um, can you imagine the infrastructural advantage that we have in the US? So technological advancements are there. We just have to bring them here with uh, stability. On the other hand, uh, the terrestrial grid, yes, we, we spoke about, everyone knows about, there was a question uh, what it is um, that we are missing. We have been unfortunately happy with our grid for a long time. We didn't do much. Uh, our engineers here, they liked the cable, the structure, the infrastructure as they were, uh, and they did not change. And now the time has come. We have to change. We have to increase, improve uh, the overheads to underground. I mean, there is no question. I mean, you have wildfires, you have, you know, uh, hurricanes, you have so many things, uh, but you have to plan it accordingly. I don't say that everything should be underground. Uh, this would be insane, but there are many parts and pieces that we can uh, put underground. So the geopolitical situations we touched already, uh, and then the inflation. Uh, here there are many stakeholders that are decision makers on the PPAs, uh, you know, the, the, the purchase uh, price of the energy, the agreements. Um, we have to be patient uh, because the world has changed. After the Ukrainian war, after COVID, the world has changed. The inflation is a problem, is a variable, and we have to, we have to use it as a variable. Uh, if you build a wind farm for 40 years or 60 years, then you have to be able to also have that wind farm um, producing, um, paying back the investments. So, and inflation is sometimes not allowing it. So we have to be flexible giving the developers that you saw in the previous panel to give them the opportunity to adjust. Uh, and this is what is happening. Therefore, you see lots of discussions in the news about uh, the PPAs are not good. The PPAs are, you know, they want to cancel the project. The projects are not going to be canceled. I guarantee you this, that the projects are not going to be canceled. The projects will go on because the economic value is there and we will continue. The only thing is sometimes we see a bump in the road and inflation is a bump in the road that most probably uh, it will be tackled uh, or it will become part of our business proposition. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Han. <laughs> All right, Charlie, you're up next. Thanks. Uh, Prismian sounds like a great client to have. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, I uh, Hakan, I identified with your comment about your daughter. So years ago, I was interviewed on a television program, and afterwards, my daughter saw the tape. And I said, so, Sophie, what did you think? And she said, Dad, you sound exactly like you do every day. And I wasn't sure whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> So, um, so vessels, uh, you, can't do, you can't do any of this without the transmission lines, you can't do any of this without the towers, the OEMs, the turbines, the blades, but you also can't do any of it without the vessels. So the, the, the slide I have up here is uh, basically taken from uh, a National uh, Renewable Energy Lab report in January about what is needed to get to 30 gigawatts uh, by 2030. And you can see the, the various categories of vessels are listed and also the basic numbers. Uh, for example, having uh, a certain number of wind turbine installation vessels and a certain number of cable A vessels and so on. 
So I'm going to talk about these vessels a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about um, sort of the legal overlay that you have to think about when you're when you go offshore, the jur the jurisdictional requirement, the dreaded Jones Act we've already heard about, and uh, and then that will transition us into current issues. So WTIV, a uh, wind turbine installation vessel. So you see a, uh, several versions of the of these up on the slide. The the sort of the bottom right is uh, the installation of the two turbines off the coast of Virginia. That's the JDN vessel, Yandano vessel. You can see it's pounding in a monopile. It has on deck uh, another monopile and then two, two, the two transition pieces, the yellow the yellow uh, objects. Um, as, as was said before by Catherine, uh, this vessel transitioned everything from Canada. That's of course, because we're only talking about two turbines. No one's gonna do that with 80 turbines or 175 turbines. Um, that, that's all gonna be staged in the United States. It's the vessel itself and the other ones you see here are all jack-up vessels, meaning they have the ability with the legs to take themselves out of the water. That of course provides you with a very stable platform. Um, the, the left uh, side of the screen is the vessel that's probably gonna do vineyard, at least a, a tower part, it's the a Deme vessel. And then you see sort of a future uh, version of a, of a wind turbine installation vessel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of the Jones Act, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, as I said, you, you have to also consider having vessels that take components from a US port out to the installation vessel. So the left-hand slide is the Fred Olson vessel um, that installed the five turbines off the coast of Block Island in Rhode Island. And you see sort of in the distance that lift boat which was also uh, had the ability to jack up and was used as the feeder to bring components from shore out to this WTIV. Of course, again, we're only talking about five turbines in that instance. They were small uh, towers, six megawatt. Uh, and the, th this lift boat is not usable for the, the larger 15, 16 megawatt towers. Um, then, you, then you can see also the most basic feedering model, which is a towed version, which is just basically a deck barge of which the United States fortunately has some and towed. That's, that's the model that you're going to see in many of the projects for a while. For example, in Vineyard Wind that's going in the water this summer, uh, that's basically the method for bringing out the components to the uh, wind turbine installation vessel. Um, CLV, cable lay vessels. Hakan will uh, recognize the, the barge version out here. The, bar the barge on the right is a version of a cable lay vessel that's very useful inshore because it's shallow draft. Um, it has the ability to do the near shore part of the project or at least most of it. And then you have uh, uh, one of Hakan's uh, competitors uh, cable lay vessels on the other side. Yeah, you do have some competitors, not very many. <laughs> Uh, one, of, one of the things with uh, monopile construction is it's necessary to place stones, rocks at the base of the monopile to prevent scour um, from occurring, to prevent erosion. Um, that's usually done with a pattern of rocks initially. Uh, then the monopile is driven uh, into, the, into the seabed. Then more rocks are piled up, sometimes three patterns. Um, the, uh, the vessels for this purpose are specialized vessels. You can see uh, two versions here. There's a Buscalis vessel and a Deme vessel. They, they basically are, are very stable vessels. They're, they have a, a, what's called a fall pipe system, which is a, um, uh, goes over the side of the vessel such that it dumps the rocks in exactly where they need to be. Um, uh, Then when you get to the uh, somewhat in the installation phase of projects, but then maybe even more so in the, in the very long O&M phase, you need vessels to be able to take people out to the wind farm to do maintenance, to do inspection, to do repairs. And there's, there's basically two models. There are hybrids to be discussed. 
Um, but the two models are CTVs and SOVs, crew transfer vessels. Those are the smaller vessels. SOVs, the service operation vessels, those are the, the larger ones. The two models are either you take people out every day and they, they go up into the tower and that's the CTV model. For that, you need a relatively small, fast vessel. The preferred, the preferred type is a aluminum catamaran and you can see um, you can see the catamaran feature on the one picture. That's a picture I actually took um, for the vessel that services uh, Block Island. And then you see the SOV style on the right. Uh, one is a sort of future concept, one is an existing uh, uh, conversion. And these, these vessels are designed with excellent habitation spaces, uh, with a place for, for the people to work at two weeks at a time. So they go out, they have the ability to put people onto the tower. They have a walk to work system that you can see deployed uh, in the one picture that's very stable. Uh, it's, it's designed to make it a very safe transfer of people to and from the, the, the transition piece. And, um, and as I said, these, these vessels go out for two weeks. The, the people go out for two weeks, they come back, they pick up another crew. So basically two crew system uh, working at two weeks at a time. The obvious advantage of th these vessels, although they're very expensive, is that you don't have the people transitioning for a lot of their time. You don't you don't want your people getting out there all beaten up from a, from their from the the voyage. Uh, I, I can tell you that when we went out to see Block Island, as soon as you clean cleared the headwaters and there against the bay, the the water turned rough and and the boat bounced around. And this was in October, where the weather was actually pretty good. So you don't you don't want that, uh, that wear and tear on your people if you can avoid it. But the SOVs are very expensive. The a US built SOV is 80, $100 million a copy. A, a CTV, 10, $12 million. So that's all I had for slides. I, I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, as I said, jurisdiction and Jones Act. So you, you can't really understand what is going on offshore legally operationally unless you understand how the United States is a, has approached offshore jurisdiction. So most of the offshore is not part of the United States. It's only, the United States has only extended limited jurisdiction to the outer continental shelf. Out to three nautical miles, that's physically part of the United States. Beyond three nautical miles, out to 200, the jurisdiction is limited by a law called the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. And you can tell by the date it was enacted, which is 1953, that it was an oil and gas statute. And that, that law is, is very particular. And, and as it's only made major amendments have been in 1978, 2005, and 2021. That, that law has been, was interpreted until relatively recently to only extend jurisdiction to things on the, on, the, on the outer continental shelf, the OCS. In other words, devices or installations that are attached to the seabed. So for example, if you have a vessel floating over the OCS, that's not within the jurisdiction of the United States for this purpose. There's something needs to be attached, a wellhead, uh, a monopile. Something needs to be there for that to become subject to federal jurisdiction. The problem was when the United, when the US Congress amended the, the law in 2005 to provide for the first time leasing authority for renewable energy projects, it forgot to change the jurisdictional element. So for a long time, it was unclear which, whether federal law applied to renewable energy projects offshore. The developers all proceeded as if it did, but that was an assumption. That was not actually what the law necessarily said. Congress sort of fixed that in early 2021. And as, as Congress is wont to do, and I'm sure this doesn't surprise anybody, they did it in a messy way again. In other words, they changed the law, they added renewable energy, but they also fiddled with the way that jurisdictional words work, stuff which has led to disputes. So that's, that's sort of the baseline of what you have offshore. Then Jones Act. So the, the United States has always had a law that reserves US domestic maritime trade to US vessels. The first one was in 1789. 
the, 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 the version that we have more or less today was from 1817. People say it's from 1920, it's not from 1920. And if you wanna trace it back, it goes back to Queen Elizabeth and I don't mean Queen Elizabeth II, I mean the first. Um, so um, this, this law reserves US domestic maritime trade between points in the United States to US flag vessels that are qualified. And by that, I mean, they must be built in the United States and they must be owned and operated by US citizens. And by virtue of it being US registered, the crew must be US citizens almost entirely. The, the, the issue for the industry is these tend to be expensive vessels and for offshore wind, most of the vessels I showed a little while ago don't exist in the US flag fleet. So that there's a necessity to use foreign vessels if we're going to build wind farms. The WTIVs, the CLVs, the, the rock dumpers, these vessels are all foreign. So if the Jones Act applies, they can't be used. So where the, the boundary between where the Jones Act applies and where it does not apply is a very important boundary. I make a very good living telling clients where that boundary is, what you can do with a, with a foreign vessel and what you can't do. So for example, it, at the moment, the pristine seabed is not part of the United States. That's the current interpretation. So a foreign vessel can pick up foundations in a port in the United States, take them out, pound them in one at a time, take out five, for example, pound them in one at a time, go back, pick up five more, and keep going. That's lawful today. But if, if the law changes and the pristine seabed becomes part of the United States, that will become unlawful. That means either you stage in Canada or you do something. The rock being dumped in at Vineyard Wind is all being brought from Canada. In other words, the law wor can, can work in a sort of a perverse way to result in, in, um, in something that is not really what everybody wants. So let me, let me just touch very briefly on current issues. So because of the way the law changed in 2021, it's not clear whether pristine seabed is part of the United States or not. There are people in the United States who would like that to be the case. They have sued the customs agency, both in Texas and DC, to make that the case. And so a lot of what the industry is doing um, up till now in terms of its planning, deciding which vessels can be used where, could go completely out the window later this year, next year, who knows? Litigation is unpredictable if either of these cases are decided against the customs service. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a space to watch. There's a lot of issues that have to resolve, be resolved, obviously, in offshore wind. Um, this is only one of them, but it's, uh, it's, it's one that's uh, pretty critical. So with that, I'll close and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Charlie. All right, clearly um, some fantastic expertise up here. Uh, on on these aspects of the offshore wind industry um, and beyond. Uh, we've got a few, um, well, we have more than a few. There are a lot of great questions. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to prioritize these. I will not ask my own um, mm -hmm. in lieu of making sure that, that we get to um, some of y'all's questions from the audience. So I'm gonna start with one that is um, applicable to the entire panel. Um, and that is how can industry and regulators increase and in support transmission planning for all projects uh, in order to minimize some of the footprints and impacts that these transmission um, aspects will will bring to uh, to the areas where they're being deployed. I don't know, Mary, do you want to start? We'll just go down the line. Yeah, Mark, sure. Yeah. I think that when it comes to things such as environmental impacts and siding, FERC doesn't have jurisdiction over that um, on in the offshore wind transmission space. States do, um, and BOEM, of course, does their environmental impact assessments on the lease areas. I would say, though, the key here is early and often communication to the communities that um, you know, these uh, projects will be impacting, of course, energy, infrastructure, and any form impacts um, people um, in, in many ways. So I think the discussions that we heard in panel one about involving communities early and often, speaking with um, regulators also early and often, um, my um, 
boss commissioner Clements has an open door policy and anyone is welcome to come request a meeting with her to discuss um, upcoming concerns, uh, projects. Of course, there are some restrictions on ex parte pending proceedings, but um, beyond that, we're always happy to discuss and sort of start the conversation early. Um, the environmental impact of many projects and their assessment. I think um, there are great agencies everywhere in the country that are regulating based on the experience and also based on the uh, local conditions. Uh, and then there are also the other stakeholders um, that are also interested as, um, as persons um, in these projects. Um, I think um, whatever we do, whatever policy, because everything changes in from different countries to countries, you know, developed countries different, uh, developing countries different, uh, even states are different, you know, some states are more concerned, some are less concerned, uh, but I think uh, we should never forget the big picture, um, you know, when we make these decisions. I mean, uh, I was talking to one of my uh, friends here um, uh, about um, when we talk about environmental impact uh, and uh, when we make these calculations, for example, we had um, in order to um, pull a cable into a platform, we waited like six months uh, to a year um, because there was a bird nesting on one platform. So uh, I think uh, that is very sensitive and we are very uh, let me say, uh, sensitive to the environment from that perspective. And we support all the, um, let me say, um, the initiatives. Uh, but we should also look uh, to the big picture, what is happening on the other side. Um, if you don't do this and what is happening, and um, I'm not going to finger point to anywhere uh, from the oil and gas sector to the other uh, sectors because we are part also, uh, you know, we have to live together with the oil and gas sector right now. It's it's not that we can avoid it. Uh, but uh, when we make policies and decisions, we have to see the uh, overall picture. And this is what I can say. Uh, don't forget the big picture. Uh, otherwise, and common sense is always good. And I like Pareto uh, to look uh, for the 80-20 rule. Uh, that you otherwise we will no, not go anywhere. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have much to add on transmission. I, let me, can I answer a question that was asked before that I saw on Slido, which is, can you, how many vessels can you repurpose from the oil and gas industry in the United States? And the answer is very few, unfortunately. Um, the, 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 it's really at the margins. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, okay. Well, uh, somewhat in the same vein um, of increasing support for transmission and transmission planning, clearly this is something that is extremely important for the industry on whole. Um, what do you all see as the role of independent transmission providers who are seeking to build more of that backbone structure, um, that HVDC that, that wouldn't necessarily be owned by a particular developer, by a state, by a region. Um, you know, I think we've seen some struggles with, with independent development of long range transmission on land over the last decade, um, but is there hope for that uh, offshore? We can go backwards this time. Any comments there, Charlie? Catherine, you keep asking me transmission questions. <laughs> Well, you Ask know, me a have, you worked, question. You, have you worked with any, um, with any uh, of the independent offshore um, transmission folks or no? No. All right. I'll give you an, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a softball one next time. Go ahead. Okay. So um, um, from the um, transmission um, perspective, I think uh, it's not, I mean, um, the decision should be based on the project, not who does it. So I think uh, if the project is good um, and if the project is serving uh, an economical uh, purpose, uh, it should be decided based on that. I know that there are lots of uh, different um, stakeholders that are um, competing with each other. 
and I see um, more the utilities in the US, uh, less uh, the developers. Now the developers are coming, especially on onshore. Um, there are many projects that are really interesting and very, uh, but they have been canceled. So I, I can name a few of them that we were part of it and has been canceled uh, because of the uh, priority setting uh, towards, you know, some stakeholders that are more important than the others relative. But I think if you have a project and the viable, uh, it can be, uh, it should be done uh, by any, any party. And this is what we see everywhere. So if you are financially strong, technically strong, and if the project is viable, it's good to go. So from, from my perspective, I think that independent transmission owners are absolutely a part of the puzzle. Um, they will be operating in a difficult environment as they already do. I think transmission is already di fairly difficult um, on the grand scheme of things to plan and build for the United States. The challenges um, of offshore are probably even more difficult. So I think they are um, heightened in that sense. Uh, for those who follow the FERC uh, notices of proposed rulemaking, there are some elements of that that involve sort of competition and elements around competition. Um, I won't get into those today, but those are, um, suffice it to say, fairly contentious issues. The last thing I'll note is that for offshore wind transmission, especially for the um, high voltage DC cables that, that were mentioned, I think that there's also a gap from what I understand in a lot of R&D in making sure that these are appropriately assessed and used in the offshore wind space, um, and also just the standardization of equipment and standards and grid codes. There's a lot of regulatory environment that is not yet built around these cables, and so um, getting a sense of getting those components moving forward as well will help these um, independent transmission owners play a role in this, but it is a challenge, I understand. All right, thanks. Um, I've got time for one more very quick question. So, Charlie, um, I have I have a well, I, I'm trying to merge a few different ship questions here, but um, I'm going to give you a controversial one and then ask you to to answer it in two minutes. If um, if offshore wind is a national uh, priority for the United States, um, then how does maintaining the Jones Act uh, factor into that long term? Well, the, the, jo the Jones Act has a tremendous support network, and the chances of it changing in our, the foreseeable future is basically nil. So how, how it's going to be balanced together is the offshore wind industry has to live with the Jones Act and vice versa. Excellent. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. Well, please join me in thanking uh, our panel for today. <laughs>